All right, welcome back. I hope this morning's session was as encouraging as it was to me, to all of you. I'm excited about this session right now. Last night we talked about the impact of the gospel on our lives. And don't you come away after that longing for God to use you to bring salvation, to bring that power of the gospel to the nations. So what we want to talk about today is a lot of the terms and things that you've been hearing, and we want to make sure that there's clarity, that we understand that we're on the same page with what we mean by things like, what is a missionary? What is the Great Commission? So we're going to take some time doing that this morning. Um, as you have met Ryan and Brooks, but you probably haven't yet met our brother Harshit. So let's just take a moment. If you could introduce yourself, tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Harshit Harshit Singh. Uh, I'm from India, and I pastor a church in India. Great. Okay, so as we take a few minutes on this panel, we're going to kind of break it into three parts. We want to take some time to, do some, to bring some clarity to some definitions, and then we want to talk about goers and senders. I'm going to read to you a couple of verses from Romans. It says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. What we see when we read this passage is that there are multiple parts to this equation. We are so excited about those who God may send that are be goers. We're also excited about those who God uses to send others. Two parts to a very important equation, goers and senders. So we're going to take some time to bring some clarity to definitions, then we're going to look at goers, and then we're going to look at senders and how all of this works together. So as we start, Harshit, I would love to ask you, what is the Great Commission? I think the best way uh, for the best place for us to go to is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, where Jesus says to his, his disciples just before um, ascension, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think remembering what Jesus commanded his disciples to do, to take the gospel, the good news, to the ends of this earth, ages, to all the people around them. Um, it involves Christians, people who trust in the gospel, who've been born again, who are filled with the Spirit, the message that has changed them, transformed them. They cross various barriers, whether it's cultural, it is a language, or geographical barrier, they take the gospel trusting and obeying what Jesus had said to the disciples and to us in the church and engaging in this task of sharing the gospel with the people around the world. I think that is the great, great commission. And when the people to whom the gospel has gone out to, when they hear, they respond and they're born again by the, because of the work of the Spirit, they become part of local churches wherever they are and they're brought in those communities so they continue to grow in the work of discipleship in their lives. Amen. So what you've heard, we see in the Gospels, the things that you see, you read about Jesus' life and his ministry, and then his last words to his disciples. He gives them this mandate, this marching orders. This is what you're supposed to do. And then in the book of Acts, we see what they did in response to that. So Harshit shared some of this, but just to um, double down on this, Ryan, what exactly is a missionary? It's a great question. It's a very, very important question. Uh, a, a missionary is a qualified Christian, so qualified in character and competency, sent out by a local church. You can't be a missionary without being sent out by a local church, very, very important. To a place of recognized need, usually crossing geographic, cultural, linguistic barriers in pursuit of the Great Commission, pushing out with evangelism, discipleship, church planting, and training up of leaders. So that sounded pretty specific, and we hear sometimes everyone is a missionary. Would you agree with that statement? 
Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people will read the Great Commission and say, oh, commission, mission? We're all missionaries. This is great. You, you, you hear this language over and over and over again. And, and friends, you should all be doing the work of evangelism and discipleship. But that does not qualify you to call yourself a missionary. You have to be sent out for that specific purpose to a place of need with all of those other things to be called a missionary. You just, you're being a faithful Christian to do evangelism and discipleship. And so I think we have to be very, very careful about our definitions. This is what a faithful Christian is. And then here's this category of missionary that's unique. That's great. As Harshit shared the Great Commission, we noticed that it's not a general command just to make disciples. It's a very specific command to make disciples of all nations. So, Brooks, I would like to ask you, as we're thinking about that, what do we mean when we say unengaged? Well, so unengaged, unreached, because I think we're going to get to that as well. Those are two terms that have been thrown around a lot, especially in the last 20 years. And so, Unengaged would be a group that has very little engagement with them or no engagement depending on which group is defining it. But it's a group of people, usually they're an ethnic group and the dominant marker of an ethnic group, hands down, is their language. And so it's that particular group that has nobody working with them and then you bring in these two guys' definitions to see disciples raised up and a church planted among them. And so. You're unreached, unengaged, unreached, we wouldn't say they're reached. Some of the more broad agencies would say less than 2%. There's this magic 2% number. I'm not a big fan of the 2% just because you can't find it in the Bible. But you would say there's something going on there, but there's not enough to propagate itself to where it can reach itself. English would be an example of we have enough resources in this language to propagate the gospel within itself. That doesn't mean that there shouldn't be good English churches around the world in places where it's a smaller minority group, but an unreached, unengaged, you're going to have that 2% is kind of going to be the defining marker between the two of them. So unreached, 2%, not quite, the, or unengaged, we haven't got 2% yet. When you think about that, it just makes me think, before we went overseas the first time, we had uh, an uncle that said, why don't you just stay here? There are lost people on your street. And I love thinking about the fact, the difference between those who are engaged, meaning there is enough gospel witness. The fact that I was on their street means that they're in a place where they can, re there are churches, there's the Bible translated in their language, there are ways for them to have access to the gospel. But there are unreached, who don't have much access, and there are those still yet unengaged, meaning no one even has yet a plan to take the gospel to them. So Ryan, tell us what is the 1040 window, and why do we hear about it? Yeah, that's a great question. So what Brooks talked about in terms of the 2% definition, that was something that missiologists came up with to helpfully define an area of need. Another thing they came up with was this and the 1040 window is a section from 10 degrees uh, to 40 degrees latitude north. I'm trying to think about my geography. So 10 degrees to 40 degrees latitude north. And in that section spanning across North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, there's over 3 billion people. And most of those groups that don't currently have access to the gospel... Uh, can I switch with you for a second? Most of those groups that don't have access to the gospel uh, live in that band. And I think it's just a helpful way to look at an area of need. And so we need to just keep it in that place. This is a helpful category. It's not in the Bible. There's no 1040 window reference. Uh, but if you want to look for a place of strategic need where most of the world's Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists live, it's in the 1040 window. So there's a lot of desperate need in that area. But Ryan, let me also ask you, does that mean there's not important work going on outside of the 1040 window? Yeah, great follow-up question. There's a done 1040 window. There's a ton of 40 window. <laughs> this might be spiritual warfare, so we're gonna try this one more time. 
there is a lot of work that still remains to be done. Here's the, here's the thing, there's over 200 million economic and uh, other types of migrants around the world. Some of those representing groups that have never heard the gospel before. And so if we neglect our, our neighbors, if we neglect some of these other regions in the world, we're going we're gonna to miss out on some important work. There's also, we're hearing more and more from friends in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and others like, hey, we need some help over these next few years, but we think we're ready to jump in the game and help send missionaries to some of these places that are also in need. And we've got to be very, very careful that we want to help them out as well in our efforts. I would just piggyback on what Ryan's saying. There's this phrase, and there, there's a book, we talked about it last night in the breakout. Uh, John Piper's done a really good job in Let the Nations Be Glad, especially chapter 5. If you read chapter 5 and you get into what that passage that Harshit read, and you're looking at that, the, you're looking at specific groupings of people. There's always, that, that's, if you go to Revelation 5-9, Revelation 7-9, every tribe, language, people, nation. If we talk broadly about billions being unsaved, it's not as helpful as talking about where are the groupings, where are the pockets, where are the tribes, the languages, the peoples, finding those and being strategic. We can, you can throw a dart on the board and there will be need there anywhere around the world. But to be strategic, we need to look for where are the groupings, where are the concentrations of these peoples. And so one of those pockets was a 1040 window. It, it's a grouping of sorts, but there are other needs within countries. And that's where, as you start to break down peoples and languages, this is where let the nations be glad. That chapter five is incredibly helpful. It's great, super helpful. I want to take a moment and just talk about, to all three of you, what actually makes an effective missionary. So, Harshit, you're in India. What is it like spiritually there? And what do you think missionaries need to be effective in that context? Um. <clears throat> I think uh, um, the very fact that India is a country that has very little gospel presence and very few faithful gospel preaching churches in proportion to the population that we have. It is challenging for anyone to follow Christ, to be growing spiritually, to be nourished, particularly if you are in any part of the country where there are no other believers. If you are in a city or a town or a village where there are other believers, other Christians, then you have help that you need to to grow spiritually and to not only just grow but actually flourish spiritually. So I think it comes back to the idea of is there a faithful Bible believing gospel preaching community of other believers and are you able to plug into that community and that helps you to grow spiritually, to thrive spiritually and to be a faithful gospel witness and to engage in the work of the Great Commission to preach the gospel to the people around you. Um, what makes a, an effective gospel worker? I think um, I would want to say to everyone present here, even before you think about going and reaching the nations around the world, I think you need to think about your life right now here, where you are. Are you a faithful Christian now and not just an individual believer? You, me and Jesus only, but are you given to a community of believers? Are you plugged into a local church that is preaching the gospel faithfully? Do you have people around you that are uh, helping you to grow more in Christ likeness? Once you have been part of a church like that and you've served in that church, you've, you've been a faithful member of the church and the church and the elders and the people around you have affirmed you and your life, I think that kind of person is the best person to take the gospel around the world. Unless and until you've done that here, you shouldn't be there because you will go there and cause a lot of problems. Just go there and be an individualistic person trying to do things by yourself on your own for the gospel and it doesn't help. It actually undoes a lot of work that should be done. So good. Just to reiterate, when people come to me, and in fact, I've had some in breaks that say, what is the one thing that you would tell us? If I could do one thing, one piece of counsel, be the absolute best church member you can be right now. That is a great way to start your preparation for going overseas. 
if you cannot love the church here, you will not love the church there. That's right. That's right. That got, is absolutely right. You've got to love Christians here, then only you love Christians over there. So I would love to hear from the two of you, what would you add, what does it take to make an effective long-term missionary? Uh, I'll throw out two, one that I talked about last night. I think effective long-term missionaries know their church history. They mm -hmm. know what happened in that country. They've read well. Uh, just put a plug in here. Read good books. Read good biographies. They, they have a way of transforming an individual to where they can see past their setting. You can see past 2024, where you've been raised. They, they're just an incredible gift to us. And then read good theology. Christians who go plant churches in other locations know their Bible. They've studied well. And so they've got that side of it where they're reading good books, and they've also been trained well. Your primary training comes not through seminary but through being a regular church member. Now your seminary will give you certain other gifts and skills, but there's additional training depending on how far out you're going to go. I'm a big fan of training, as many of you know. If you're going to get to those hard places, read good books, get extra training. I think those are two very, very helpful things, theological and practical training for getting to the ends of the earth. That's so good. Brooks, what one book, if you're going to tell people, start with this one book, what would it be? Uh, let the nations be glad. No, no, no. I already plugged that one. Uh, we're going to the Golden Shore by Courtney Anderson, the biography of Adoniram Judson. There's, to me, they're the two top two, hands down, autobiography of John Payton to the Golden Shore, Adoniram Judson. Like it's, they'll change your life. All right, write that down. All right, Ryan, what would you add? Yeah, uh, I would highly, highly concur with my brothers. What they've said is really good. I think I would add in someone who is pursuing a godly character and values holiness in their own life. Harsh has already talked about the importance of the local church in that, um, but you also have a responsibility to regularly spend time in God's word and in prayer. And if you are not fighting sin in your life, you are not yet ready to go overseas. If you're struggling with things like pornography and laziness and other sinful tendencies and habits, you need to lean into your local church and confess those sins and then get godly counsel and accountability to fight sin in your life because life is going to get harder when you get overseas. Learning a language is really, really hard. Being thousands of miles away from your family is going to be really, really hard. And the enemy does not want you there. And so you need to learn how to fight sin in your own life and how to pursue holiness. And Brooks loves uh, recommending books. I'm going to recommend one. If you're thinking about spiritual disciplines, what does he mean by this? Don Whitney has a great book on spiritual disciplines. So does David Mathis called Habits of Grace. So Spiritual Disciplines by Don Whitney, Habits of Grace by David Mathis. Friends, fight sin in your life. Pursue holiness. And that is getting you one and two and three steps closer to being ready to be a qualified missionary. Amen. Um, so while we're at you, Ryan, what is the ultimate goal of a missionary or a missionary team? The ultimate goal is to see a local church established that is healthy, which means that all of the right things of a church are in order. Uh, it's being led by a plurality of qualified local elders that have been trained up to lead that church. And it has a heart for church planting within its own region and then also in other places. So you've got to have a healthy local church that desires to multiply. They want to do it very, very biblically. They don't want to go too fast in how they do that, but they want a biblically multiplying local church that is being led by elders that are qualified in character and competency. All right. Let's stop there for just a moment. Brooks, I would love to hear your thoughts when we think about that. So if that is the goal and we are complementarian in our theology, what does that mean for people that aren't pastors? Um, does that mean that only pastors can do missionary work? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so you've got various, uh, so when we were in Papua New Guinea, where my wife and I served for 13 years, we had pilots that would fly us into the jungle. We had accountants that would get the money from U.S. dollars into PNG Kina and get us food and supplies and things like that. And there are different roles, but if you're talking about your primary church planter teacher role, they've got to be 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1 qualified. They've got to have those qualifications in there. 
If they're not, then, man, there's some deacon qualifications. Deacon qualifications are, just so you know, they're shorthand for being a good church member qualifications. That's, that's what those are. Uh, the, the ability to teach, though, that's an elder qualification. So you want those for your pastor teachers. And then just touching really briefly, because way, way, way over half of the missionary force are women. And so some of you guys are thinking, wait a second. So you've got women overseas that are doing some incredible things. We are complementarian. John, here we're not, well, some of us are Baptist, some of us are Presbyterian. We'll talk about that later. Um, but we're complementarian, and we want our women to know how to teach the word. We want them to teach because some of you are going to go to Muslim context where initially the church is not going to or the teaching is not going to happen in mixed genders. You're going to have women teaching women. You're going to men. And so you have to have your women up to speed in these things. They're going to be translators. My translation was incredibly blessed by two single ladies who taught me how to be a better translator during the time I was there from the 13, 15 years that they had been translating prior to me arriving there. So you have single ladies who are going to be incredibly helpful in all of these different realms. But again, ladies teaching ladies and being faithful where they're at in the skills and the giftings that hopefully they've been equipped in before they get there. Praise God. I hope you all hear that if you are in this room, every single one of you, if you are in Christ, you can be used in missionary work. So we've talked about what makes an effective goer, but when we, we looked at that passage in the book of Romans, we saw that a very important part of this equation are effective senders. So I would like to take a moment, because honestly, sometimes in some settings, we can actually focus so much on the goers that the senders are kind of looking like second-class citizens, and that's not what we see in Scripture. So I want to say, um, just here, why are we striving at this conference to to encourage senders, to support senders, to want senders to be trained as well. What are ways that senders can be involved well in missions? Harshit? I'm, I'm going to do the same thing again. By being faithful church members, by being faithfully committed in the local church here. Um, when you're involved in a local church, you're, you're investing in the lives of others, you're serving faithfully, um, even though you're not out there, you're enabling the task of going, whether it is by praying, whether it is by giving, or whether it is by visiting, or just using whatever skills, gifts that God has given you to use that to serve in your church here. I think I want the people here to understand if the churches here are strong, if the, if the believers yet come truly committed to the gospel here, if they're not living... Um, a complacent life, if they're living a life of sacrifice here, that has massive ramifications for the gospel worldwide. Because what you do here during the week in your community will create a community that will be powerful, that will take the gospel out to the ends of the ages, even if you per se, personally, do not go out. So you're sending people, you're praying for them, you're encouraging them, you're supporting them, and you're getting behind them. I think that'd be a good way of being a good sender. Great. That's great. So for, from both of you, what would you add to that? What would you say to encourage senders? I think two things. Senders raise their children to be goers. There's probably 90% of you in this room that are going to be senders. The question is whether you're going to be good senders or bad senders. Good senders raise their sons and daughters with the distinct possibility God may call you someday and it's the heroes you set in front of them that will make them aspire to being a goer or be turned off from it. What do you put them to bed at night reading them? Do, you, do they know the story of Amy Carmichael? Have they heard of John and Betty Stamm? Have they heard of Gladys Allward? Have they heard of Adoniram Judson? Did, were you faithfully putting this in front of them so that this was a possibility for their life or was this something that was an uncrossable line? That's what we find with a lot of parents. Everybody wants to have great missionaries just as long as it's not my son and daughter. Good senders raise their sons and daughters to be goers. And then good senders have skin in the game. They're behind their missionaries from their local church. They're their missionaries. They're not reaching and teaching missionaries as much as I love reaching and teaching. They're not the IMBs. They're not GSIs. They're 
their churches. And so good senders, are, we know those people. We have them over to dinner. We send them regular packages overseas. We go when it's a good time to go visit them. We get to know them when they're back home. Good senders have skin in the game in many, many ways. Great. Ryan, what would you add? Be an informed prayer partner. Uh, what I mean by that is sign up for people's prayer letters, read them, preach, and pray for them. I want to give you guys some inside information. Most of you are going to receive prayer letters through something called MailChimp or something like it. And there's a secret that the missionaries that are sending you those letters can tell whether or not you are opening them or not. It's true. And I am heartbroken at the statistics that 25 to 30% of prayer letters are opened. That is one of the most discouraging things to a missionary who is calling out for prayer. Now, some of that, to my missionary friends in the room, we have to be better at writing prayer letters. They cannot be boring. They cannot drone on and on and on. This crowd has a short attention span. I also have a short attention span. So you got to hook me and write a really good letter. But senders, you have to faithfully pray. I love Amy Carmichael. I love her writings. This woman that, that the Lord used faithfully in India, she wrote almost 40 books. And those books, she did not just sit down and write books. They're actually compilations of poems and letters that she used to inform her senders on how to pray. And it was beautifully well written, and the Lord still continues to use them. So be a faithful prayer partner. <clears throat> that was so good. As we close this panel, I just want to say I have so much respect for these three brothers for their ministries and their lives and their commitment to the gospel and their character that matches it. I am just, honestly, I'm truly honored to sit up here with the three of you. I am so thankful to the Lord for your ministries. Um, I would love to ask Brooks, would you close us in prayer? Father in heaven, we are grateful for your son. We are grateful for the mercy that is found in him. We pray for the many tribes, languages, peoples, and nations that do not know him. We thank you for the Great Commission. We thank you for your final marching orders that you gave to your church. May we be faithful church members, and may we be faithfully about your Great Commission to the end of our days or until you return. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.